hello. Hello, Alex. How are you? I'm great. How are you? How do you feel? I'm very good. Very good. Albeit slightly cold, winter is well and truly here. Yeah, most definitely. I went through the same thing in the beginning of the week. So we split <laughs> the week between us. Yeah. Or well, I'm I'm looking forward to it ending, but unfortunately, that's a, a wee way away for for here. So uh, we have. Uh, very interesting space today because we have a special guest who is already with us here and his name is Alexander Zyderson and uh, you know him very well as do all of us. Hi Alexander, you can uh, request to speak and we will uh, put you on. Hey, hey everyone, can you hear me? So while Alexander is joining, oh, here he is. Hello, hello. Long time. Hello, Beam. <laughs> hello, Alexander Zyderson. Hey, hey, good to be so, here. So uh, let me kind of introduce the reason for this uh, amazing reunion. And uh, I see that Vladi has joined as well. Uh, so first of all, we, we never need a special reason to get together because, uh, you know, we're all old friends and uh, also uh, old BIM colleagues. And uh, uh, as you know, BIM is going to celebrate uh, a fifth anniversary very soon in the beginning of January, which is, uh, I think, in it of itself a great occasion. But in addition to that, uh, we want to congratulate Alexander uh, with the receiving the, um, I would say, a Guinness Book of Records um, kind of uh, anointment for being the first ever CEO of two different privacy projects in crypto. Oh, is that true? <laughs> the first one? I, I, well, I, th I think, yes, I think. Uh, he's the first one we know. <laughs> uh, because Alexander recently joined Secret Network as a CEO. And uh, yeah, congrats. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, we have, uh, like we as BIM community, we have a lot of questions for you. And uh, we have prepared a long list. Um, That's but, awesome. Uh, maybe before we start with the questions, tell us a little bit about uh, about how this happened and what you're doing and, you know. Uh... Well, so the way that happened is that uh, Secret was going through like uh, certain changes and the founder guy, his name is Guy, he decided to move to more of a research role um, and not doing the day to day. And he was looking for people to help him with this thing. And, uh, you know, we have some common friends and acquaintances and, uh, you know, I was one of the candidates and, you know, this happened. So that's well, as simple as that. Now, wh why great. I wanted to do it is because, you know, uh, Secret is actually, they have two things. Well, kind of similar to Beam, right? So they have the privacy and they have the, the smart contracts thing and the computation and DeFi and everything else. And this kind of combines the two things I was, you know, the privacy I was doing in Beam. I know that later on Beam also developed a smart contract, but in my time it was not there yet. And then uh, last couple, couple of years I was working on VirtuSwap, which is a new DEX project. And I learned a lot about uh, DeFi and smart contracts and all that and got really fascinated. So to me, Secret kind of united those two things and... Uh, I mean, it was exciting, so I uh, I didn't think too much. No, that's definitely a great uh, to be, you know, working on privacy, as we know. It's a very absolutely yeah. Topic. And uh, uh, now I think uh, uh, probably, I mean, privacy was always important, but uh, in the recent, I think, years, like couple of years, uh, we saw a lot of interesting developments in many different areas, starting from regulation and CBDCs and uh, digital identities and all of these things. And uh, they're all, re they all require privacy. And uh, I think developing privacy solutions is, is a great thing to do in any time of the week. Yeah, I mean, I think that now we see like when we started uh, Beam, uh, right, there was a lot of talk about privacy in transactional privacy. And I mean, I think for various reasons, it, it didn't get where we hoped it will go, right? Because back then, you know, people were talking about uh, new privacy coin replacing Bitcoin, right? Alex, we all remember that. It, that was the talk on the street. Uh, Absolutely. It didn't happen. Uh, 
I mean, we can analyze uh, why, and uh, but the fact is it didn't happen, maybe because people don't care that much about privacy. Uh, maybe it's kind of hard to sell. Maybe, as some people say, privacy is a feature and not like a uh, full blockchain uh, justification. I don't know, but for whatever reasons, right? And then what happened was the DeFi, right? Because when we started, smart contract was just uh, two words which didn't have much meaning and people were dreaming all kinds of dreams that, you know, your employment contracts will be smart contracts or your rental contracts will be smart contracts. But in the end of the day, we saw that the, the thing that really caught up was DeFi, right? was trading. Trading, lending, financial applications, that really caught up. And then as it caught up and the bigger players started entering it, uh, then I think, or, or, and which is now, people start to realize that there is a problem, that you cannot be like a large hedge fund and have all your trades open. Um, you cannot, you know, place uh, limit orders that are, you know, open on the blockchain and will be immediately front run or, or you know, whatever. Uh, this whole thing with, uh, remember the recent uh, his story with, uh, with Curve, right? When this founder of Curve had a position and everybody was kind of jeering and watching when his huge position in CRV might be liquidated and then, you know, people tried to attack it. So, so I think right now there is a lot of understanding that privacy is needed and a lot of new projects actually sprung up. Uh, so, yeah, so, so I think now is, uh, kind of a renewal, a, a, a good, a, a good, uh, new wave of privacy. Uh, so there is a lot of hope for all the privacy projects now. Yeah. So first of all, I totally agree that uh, a lot of things changed since we started. Um, the funny thing is that right now we're doing a, uh, kind of, uh, uh, upgrading the Beam desktop wallet uh, for the next version. And uh, we're doing a lot of changes uh, in the UI and the UX. And uh, one of the things that we're changing is that uh, menu that we had on the left, which was just growing and growing and growing. And you know, initially we all only had like send and receive, and then we added the atomic swaps. And then later we added smart contracts and uh, asset swaps and a lot of other things. So we just keep, kept adding buttons to this menu until it became completely full and there was no like place to put anything. So now as we're moving things around, we really understand how much the focus has changed, how much the DeFi and the applications, the centralized applications uh, are more uh, kind of in, in, in focus and transactions are very important, but they're no longer the main kind of focus on, of many applications. So yeah, for, for that, I totally agree. And also we saw this explosion in uh, MEV, uh, which is based on the ability to see and uh, preview transactions before they happen, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. So this is definitely, so I think this is the focus of Secret as well, right? Because you are based on like SGX technology, which allows you to do encrypted computation inside inside the processor, right? Yeah, so maybe I can tell a little bit about, about so Secret is actually a Cosmos chain. It was developed in Cosmos. Um, and um, uh, one of the things that, one of the decisions that they uh, made in the beginning, which probably was the right decision looking back, was that the, the main token, the SCRT token, is actually not private. It's open. Okay, it's fully open, fully traceable, whatever. But the privacy, then the privacy is in the smart contracts and essentially in the state and in the parameters that are passed to the smart contract. So the technology that was chosen for secret is the SGX, which is uh, it's the software guard extensions, and it's actually a secure enclave inside some of the Intel processors, and it's an area which I don't know even the the, the the technology, but somehow it has its own private key inside that is unknown to anyone, even to the admin of the machine or to anyone. And you can encrypt things with the public key. Uh, again, maybe I'm oversimplifying, but that's, this is the gist of things. You can encrypt uh, your parameters or whatever you send to this uh, virtual machine that is running inside the SGX. You can send encrypted things, and then it does all the computation right there. And all the state of the blockchain is encrypted. And this is like the key, I think one of the key differences uh, well, of this technology from other technologies like ZK or MPC, and I think uh, also of Mimblewimble, that with SGX you can have 
uh, uh, confidential persistent state uh, of the contract. Okay, and this actually allows to develop any kinds of applications like confidential voting, uh, confidential uh, DeFi, where, well, in DeFi, actually, the uh, thing is that when you look at the pool, you know the price and you even can guess the amount, but you don't know what the trade is when the people send the trade. You cannot see it. Uh, so MEV, uh, like harmful MEV, is, is not really possible uh, on this technology. And coming back to, to MEV on Ethereum, uh, uh, I don't know again how much uh, the crowd here is familiar, but um, there is this huge project called uh, Flashbots and MEV Boost. And right now they're developing the next version of it called Suave, 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 or Suave, uh, which is standardized, unified uh, auction for value extraction. And uh, now this Suave is developing a system that will also be based on SGX. It's not related to Secret in any way, but the technology is similar. Um, and it's, you know, developed by all the brightest minds, you know, some of the brightest minds in the industry. And, and they will be using SGX to do uh, things like maybe encrypted mempools. Uh, I mean, they just had a very uh, intense episode uh, on Bankless. I recommend you listening to it, but you will need to listen like at least twice to even understand. At least it was that for me, right? Because uh, it's like very convoluted. Uh, but that that's, uh, they're using this SGX thing. Uh, XGX technology to hide stuff that needs to be hidden. And by this, they improve uh, this value extraction process and make it more, uh, you know, uh, uh, less less uh, susceptible to, to bad behavior. And by this, they actually essentially achieve more decentralization because it's less power to validators or to block builders. Yeah, so uh, we have actually a question from our community about SGX, but I just want to uh, make my one small remark. Uh, Secret and Beam are uh, like a little bit uh, the inverse of one another because Beam has uh, smart contracts with values that can be seen on top of a private chain, and Secret is exactly the opposite. So the chain itself is Cosmos, so it's not private, but the smart contracts and all of the computations inside of them are. So yeah. it's kind of the inverse of one another. Yeah, uh, on, so on Secret, there are addresses, right? So on Secret, uh, every yeah. user has an address and it can be kind of traced on what contracts they interact with, but you cannot know what they did. In Beam, it's just exactly the opposite, right? You don't know who is doing, but you know what, what they're you know doing. So on, on Secret, is the opposite. So you know who is doing, but you don't know what they're doing exactly. Uh, yeah, so before, before we talk about that, like the question about SGX, uh, SGX is a proprietary into technology, right? Exactly, yeah. And, and it's been, I mean, I'm not an expert and I don't want to fud in any way, but th there were all kinds of stories uh, about SGX security. Like, can you comment on that? Yeah, like sure, sure, sure. So, so that is true. There were, uh, I think, one or two uh, uh, attacks uh, on SGX. Uh, that were patched, right? And so potentially such attacks can unmask the privacy, right? They cannot steal the money. They cannot, uh, it's not like breaking your private keys or anything, but such kind of attacks can essentially break the privacy. Uh, okay, so uh, for secret, as far as I know, it was, uh, I think that happened like a couple of years ago or maybe a year and a half ago. So the solution in this case is just to patch and to, to change the keys. And then, uh, but in this case, potentially the history or the past of the blockchain can be exposed. So that's, that's kind of uh, a, a, a weaker spot of this technology. And yes, there is certain trust in Intel and so if somebody is like uh, a very conspiracy theory uh, person, you may even play that well, claim that, well, Intel, maybe they have like um, some magic backdoor, uh, which I mean, they, they don't have a backdoor. And then, you know, of course, they don't send any information anywhere because if they did, it would be immediately visible. But uh, it, th this technology requires some trust in Intel technology. That's that's for sure, and it's dependent on, on their engineers. Like to uh, you know, if I'm asked about that, I can say, well, you know, we are 
trusting Intel in so many ways in our day-to-day -day lives uh, that this, this is one more way. But yes, I agree, uh, you can argue there is like a weakness here, a certain weakness. Um, so that's, that's the answer. Gotcha. So the second question is uh, actually interesting because, I mean, uh, even though Beam and Secret are the inverse of one another, maybe, and that's the question from the community, are there any like interesting possibilities for cooperation between the two projects? maybe to complete one another in some way? Uh, look, I, I think, yes, uh, I, I'm sure there are ways to do things. We need to sit down and think what exactly can be done. Uh, so right now, like one of the one of the things Secret is doing is uh, reaching out to other ecosystems actually to export the privacy features to allow like EVM developers have some private state on Secret and things like this. Uh, and we also have this constellation initiative where the idea is that there is like a, a loosely organized group of uh, privacy technology. We lost you for a second. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I guess I pressed. Uh, where did you lose me? That you had the constellation exactly. uh, initiative that you're reaching out. Yeah. To. So it's like a loosely, uh, a loose, a loose constellation of different privacy technologies. Uh, and the idea is that, that it will have like some common privacy gateway for other ecosystems where the user will be able to decide on which privacy technology they want to use. Okay. So we, we are partnering with Phoenix, which is kind of a sister project to, to secret in a way, but they are just starting, but they're developing something based on uh, fully homomorphic encryption. Um, so that's, uh, one, one, you know, existing member of the constellation. So we can think of, uh, some ways of doing some things together, but again, I don't have anything concrete right now. We haven't discussed it yet. Just didn't have the time. Uh, but uh, maybe we can find something. By the way, uh, speaking about about uh, sitting down and thinking, uh, I think you now have one of the best possible people for this process. And I obviously mean Vladi, who is here with us, uh, who expressed also his uh, uh, willingness to join and uh, help you with some development things, I believe. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so uh, we announced that Vladi joined uh, joined Secret as, as core as core developer. I mean, I, I'm super happy because I think this really fits what uh, Vladi was doing before in terms of privacy. It's uh, a very similar ethos, a different technology, but with some of very similar project uh, problems on how do you solve different privacy potential privacy holes. How you improve the encryption. Uh, how you improve the uh, this very low level integration with uh, with SGX. Uh, there are some issues there, right? It's not. Uh, I mean, th there are things to do uh, on, on the technology level. Yeah, and you know the fact that Vladi has huge experience with Beam and built beautiful things there. Uh, I mean, for us, it was a natural uh, uh, thing to to see how we can work together. Yeah, so first of all, uh, uh, congratulations on that as well. Uh, we we know Vladi and I personally know Vladi for like 20 something years. Wow, you're that um, old, man. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> who would, who uh, would have guessed? I mean, uh, almost almost exactly half my life, yes, I know Vladi. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, funny story, but the first time I met Vladi, uh, we had a mutual friend and uh, uh, I was in college. Uh, I wrote down some... Uh, uh, exercise, I think it was MFC. If somebody yeah, here is old, I worked old with that remember. technology. That was yes, you're you're old as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. And I remember that I wrote some function that would just allocate uh, infinite amount of memory every time I uh, moved the cursor, and I was really surprised why my computer got stuck. So Vladi helped me to debug that, uh, and that was the first time. And he was already back then. He was a great developer back then, and now twenty years later. Uh, he's totally amazing. Uh, Vladi, I know that you're listening. Say hello. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, <laughs> thank you for such a warm word. I hope I deserve all, the, all this. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, by the way, um, Alexander Zyderson, you mentioned Phoenix. 
It's spelled F H E. That's true. And I. That's right? true. Yeah. Exactly. And if I understand correctly, the F H E uh, stands for fully homomorphic encryption. Right? Exactly. Exactly. So I, I don't know how much you're allowed or like how much public information is out there, but if you can say yeah. a couple of words about this direction, because it's very sure. Sure. Very interesting approach. It is. It is indeed. Again, there is some public information. I mean, I'm not part of that project, but I know some public stuff. And um, uh, so FHE, uh, fully homomorphic encryption, means the following. Uh, it means that uh, I can encrypt my data uh, or all of us can encrypt our data, send it to somewhere, to some place, and that place, that computer, can make calculations on this data without decrypting it. Okay? So, let's say I can, uh, we can all encrypt uh, our age with our own key, okay? And then send it to that central place, that central computer, and it would calculate the average age, okay? Uh, without knowing uh, without decrypting anything. Okay, I mean, it sounds like a little magical, but that's how it works. No, it, it, it is uh, it is magical. And uh, by the way, uh, like one of the potential approaches to implementing uh, uh, privacy within smart contracts on Beam, and uh, we kind of discussed uh, uh, these ideas uh, along the way, and actually uh, even quite recently, uh, would be using fully homomorphic encryption. The problem right now is that it's relatively limited in terms of the operations that you can perform and not in all applications. For example, we didn't find a good approach how to implement it in, in our DEX. Because after all, for DEX to function, you need to be able to see the balance, you need to be able to see the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the current trades and like what's happening to in the AMM DEX to evaluate uh, the value of the, of the pair in the pool yeah yeah so i understand it's still like a bleeding aid, uh, edge technology so to speak sure. uh that uh i mean it i think it still has its own limitations it also is computationally pretty intense um and you need to write your uh like i guess you need to write the contracts in a certain way so it's all very new so it's like a promise right now as i see it uh, but I think the team in Phoenix, I mean, they, they know what they're doing, hopefully, and uh, they are, you know, on track to, to really build that. Uh, again, it will, it will take some time. Uh, but in the end, like, if I understand correctly, the idea is that it can run just regular smart contracts in a way uh, with having everything encrypted all the way. Uh, yeah, definitely. So, so yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it is pretty exciting. It will have some trade-offs, right? It will have trade-offs in, in the computation cost, maybe in computation time and others. And, you know, that's one, one of, like, my thesis is saying that privacy is not just one size fits all. And it's not like one technology can solve all the problems. Okay, and there will be place for a combination or a constellation of those different technologies that will have different costs, different privacy guarantees, uh, and the users will choose the the right one for uh, for for every solution for every problem. Yeah, absolutely. Gus, do you have any questions for our guests? I don't have any questions. Well, I have many questions, but I but I'm enjoying listening. <laughs> okay. I I do have I do have a question, but this is probably stepping back to the to the broader picture. Um, so I might save it for later, actually. No problem. The moment you feel you, the time is nigh, you, you, you are welcome to ask it. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. So uh, in terms of the team, uh, by the way, uh, uh, Secret, uh, the, uh, the team is mostly in Israel or yeah. is also like all over the world? Yeah, the t well, actually Secret is built of two different groups. So one is the Secret Labs, which is a development company, uh, and it's mostly in Israel. And there is the foundation, the Secret Network Foundation, which is uh, kind of global. Uh, and it has people like in the States and Europe, and it's doing all the marketing, developer relations, events, 
all that stuff. And, and these two things are separate. Uh, so, I mean, we are working together, all right, but it's, it's the two separate organizations with totally separate budgets, separate funding, separate, separate everything. Gotcha. So, and, and it's kind so, of a, an interesting setup and it, you know, it seems to be working. So the, the labs team itself was always very lean, uh, and the community and the foundation were doing all the, all the marketing, all all the community, all the promotions, everything else. So the the, the labs was was actually focused only on on development and and mostly on like the hardcore uh, blockchain development. Not even you know being being in the cosmos, right, in the ecosystem. So there was no need as compared to Beam, right? No need to develop wallets or explorers or or any of this stuff around uh around the protocol because it was all or most of it came with uh with cosmos and also the the development community uh the, the developer community is pretty active and there are people that are outside and not part of any of the teams that are doing stuff uh similar to what uh, beam community is doing right building on kinds of uh, of additional features or, or projects or, or things on top of the blockchain so that was for secret it was a pretty successful in terms of the number of projects and, and people uh interested in that yeah i mean uh, having uh, support from the cosmos ecosystem which is uh, pretty impressive in it of itself uh, i i did have some uh, not too much, but a little bit of experience, like uh, investigating and researching what Cosmos is doing, how it's built. So I know that they have a lot of uh, interesting tools and projects and, uh, you know, frameworks uh, built around it. So obviously it's very helpful to have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back in the day, you know, I think three, four years from uh, ago, people were arguing that maybe Cosmos will uh, be the number one ecosystem uh and and really a lot of things happened there but then one very big thing happened which was terra luna thing which happened on cosmos and as you can imagine it didn't do very well for the ecosystem uh in general but back in the in the heyday of uh, terra cosmos was i guess you know <laughs> had billions of dollars well it all turned into a ponzi scheme but uh you know. Yeah, I mean, f first of all, three years ago, if you remember, uh, a lot of projects were uh, aiming to be number one ecosystem. Yeah, that's uh, true. Polkadot that's and true. Uh, many more. That's true. Uh, but also, I have to say that we see examples of projects recovering from uh, these kind of failures, like uh, Solana, for example, after the FTX uh, collapse. Uh, it was also a difficult period, but now they're doing yeah. better and uh, they're improving. Yeah, yeah. So actually, there was another, you know, I feel like I'm promoting Bankless. There was another podcast podcast on Bankless uh, talking about the three ecosystems, the Ethereum, the Solana and the Cosmos uh, and uh, saying that they all took different uh, different uh, like approaches to solving the security, scalability, decentralization uh, dilemma and Solana being the most centralized but most scalable, uh, right? And Cosmos being, I guess, somewhere in the middle and ethereum like uh, took the decentralization to to uh, to the highest level and yeah actually right now we're seeing also you know to, to your uh, comment about recovery so now we're seeing say dydx coming to cosmos uh which is a big sign celestia uh is on cosmos uh which is like this new protocol for storing data which is now actively being used by several l2s um uh, then we have uh what was the third one axelar which is the leading bridge uh infrastructure uh project very successful they're also they also have a cosmos chain uh so there is there things are are, are happening but i think we all can agree that at least for now uh and probably for the mid midterm and maybe forever i mean evm is the biggest Ethereum is the biggest, uh, and uh, we, I mean, we will see if somebody can dethrone EVM uh, and Ethereum, but for now, it's definitely the biggest, the, the richest ecosystem, and most of the TVL uh, is out there. Yeah, so I mean, 
Uh, from my personal perspective, I think EVM is going to be uh, as bad as JavaScript. You know, uh, we're going to be stuck with it for, for ages, even though. Yeah. Um, yeah, something like that. Even though you're limited um, and, uh, yeah, you have so many limits. But, you know, maybe in the end it's kind of, I don't, I don't know. We need to, uh, maybe after several years, we'll need to think about it more and why, and why it is winning. Because this, the Solidity language is so... It's so limiting, and uh, it kind of uh, there are a lot of things you cannot do there. Uh, but you know, maybe that is the that's one of the yeah. well, and also they have Italic, and they have uh, you know, and they are the pioneers in that space, kind of. So I guess it all it all plays a role. Uh, yeah, speaking of Vitalik, by the way, uh, did you see this uh, recent proposal or this recent paper that he co-authored with a bunch? We, we, we talked about it in one of oh, the privacy pools at length. Yes, this one. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So it feels uh, like they are thinking in this direction, but uh, it doesn't feel like they're thinking like us, uh, like in, in terms of like privacy for the, you know, everyday person without any kind of... Uh, Limitations. So it's basically a, an attempt uh, to coexist with regulators. Speaking of which, like, how do you uh, handle these topics of KYC and AML at uh, Secret? That's one of the questions from the community. Uh, People are very great concerned. question. So Secret is not developing applications, right? Uh, so we don't need to really handle that. But uh, since it's an address-based uh, blockchain. Uh, there is no inherent problem in doing KYC and ML if somebody wants to, right? Because when you when you use something on Secret Network, you log in with your Kepler or whatever, any other, like there are several wallets like Starshell, Leap, it's, and also you can use MetaMask now, by the way. So you have an identity and, and they can, I mean, if somebody wants to KYC you, they can... They can KYC you, right? And you have this identity. So it is doable. Uh, I don't think anyone is doing it right now. I'm not, not even sure. Maybe somebody is, but it's, you know, it's not up to us uh, as, as the layer one, right? We, uh, I mean, we don't care. Uh, and uh, basically that means that in a way the blockchain can be analyzed uh, by Chainalysis or other guys. And they can, you know, they can understand something. Okay, not everything, but they they can maybe do some KYC, especially if you're working with uh, with the, the secret native uh, token. That's, you know, that's simple. And I think even if you're working with uh, some of the encrypted confidential uh, assets, uh, you, we, uh, we have this uh, permit concept or, or viewing key that uh, can actually expose all my transactions to a third party. So this kind of opens up a way for this uh, opt-in kind of, uh, you know, transparency. But I, I don't, I'm not sure that this exists. Maybe, maybe it even does. Uh, I'm just not, not sure. So it is definitely possible. Gotcha. That's great. Thank you very much. It's, uh, you know, I'm I'm out of official questions from the community, uh, but we will definitely uh, find some more. And also there is a secret question from Gus that he's holding uh, for for a later time. Um, just a reminder. Gus, go ahead. I'll go now, and and this is quite a. I guess it's quite a general question, um, and and you. Have to, sorry, you have to excuse me if my dog barks, which he just did. Um, I, my question is with regards to like regulation and, and what we saw with Tornado Cash not that long ago. Uh, and, and what are your thoughts on how an increase in regulation across like the crypto sphere in general, I guess, with what we've seen from, from the aftermath of FTX and the recent Binance stuff and this kind of thing. Uh, do you see them like clamping down on privacy protocols in general or, or do you see that coming later or never? Or what are your general kind of thoughts uh, with regards to that? Um, yeah, good question. I think there will be some, some pressure. Uh, 
on privacy protocols and some pressure on on privacy protocols to introduce uh, some AML KYC compliance measures, right? So, for example, maybe you've heard of Railgun, right? Railgun is like an Ethereum. Uh, it's, I mean, it's. I think I'm not sure, but I think the technology is kind of similar to a Tornado in a way. So, what it allows you to do is you send your money in, and you get a clean address that's not uh, not uh, traceable. Okay, and then you can do your DeFi. Let's say that's that's their goal. But they do KYC. Okay, so they do KYC and. This uh, protocol is apparently used by large traders. Okay, so they just take their uh, Ethereum tokens, uh, you know, RC20 or whatever they have, they transfer them to an uh, untraceable address or unconnected address, uh, and then they do their trades. And nobody can guess or know who is doing which trade. Uh, and But this whole thing is KYC'd, right? So the case of Tornado... Uh, I think, uh, and I heard it from uh, some people, uh, like, uh, I heard it that they kind of knew what they were doing, right? It's not that they were, uh, that they were not, uh, that they were like naive, uh, you know, those uh, starry-eyed developers. Uh, I understand that they were kind of uh, asked in a way or requested uh, by the authorities to do KYC, they chose not to do it, um, and uh, I mean, yeah, it turned out very, very bad for them uh, right now. But also, they became very big, and uh, the allegations are that the you know very very bad people were using them. Okay, now this may happen to uh, to any project, I think, any privacy project. But uh, I don't think uh, anything like that happens like overnight. Uh, and privacy projects really, I think, need to take this into account and uh, and uh, you know implement certain measures that will protect the project from being attacked. And we see that the governments can be super super aggressive in in attacking uh those those projects because again in some cases you i mean there is this conflict right because we wanted to build privacy projects for people to be uh, safe from snooping uh and for for people to be able to donate uh money you know against bad regimes and so on but then do we want people to donate money to Hamas or or to terrorists? Uh, not really. Do we want people to like um, break the law? You know, maybe. No, no. There is there is violence for that. Exactly. Well, yeah. I mean, it's it's very true that people break. Uh, as we said, you know, in the begin in the first days of Beam. You know, I was always saying, well, uh, uh, how do you think people buy drugs? Uh, just with cash, right? So, so you know, arrest the 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 the, the American Central Bank uh, people who print money. But yeah, I exactly. I, I think us that that yeah, bigger uh, privacy projects uh, or people who are now starting out building uh, big uh, uh, services in this space need to take this into account. Uh, you know, and, you know, either go like full Monty and say, okay, fuck the government. We will go into hiding, uh, and, uh, you'll never find us and we'll do whatever we want, uh, or, or comply, but you need to make this choice, uh, and not to stay halfway because halfway doesn't work. Okay. I don't know if the yeah, other I mean, way works, uh, but, uh, I mean, maybe you can go hiding and be super anonymous and, and, you know, like Banksy or whoever else that cannot be found, but it's hard. There's always this uh, putting aside $4.3 billion, just in case. Oh, exactly. I mean, that's a funny... Uh, uh, actually, we just had this in secret. We have those, we call them Crypto Thursdays, when there is like uh, uh, somebody from the team just gives a kind of a short lecture on some topic about crypto. And today, actually, by coincidence, 
uh, one of the one of the developers made this uh, lecture about Binance, and we just discussed a bit about CZ and this thing. And it all, to me, like it feels like a slap on the wrist. Uh, I mean, even if he goes to jail, which I don't know, maybe maybe he won't, maybe he will. I mean, because if he will, it is really bad. I don't think it's worth any money. But some people might disagree. But if he goes for like maybe half a year or something like this, uh, then it's just a slap on the wrist. He stays with billions of dollars. He still owns a majority of Binance. Uh, but in his defense, in a way, I must say that, yeah, he broke the law, but he didn't steal other people's money. He's not like SBF, who literally stole, he took pe- money that people you know, people are put into the exchange. He just used the money for something else. CZ, at least for now, there are no no allegations that he did that. He did serve American customers. He did probably, uh, uh, they had like, oh, the KYC uh, was not perfect and they maybe let in some people who are considered bad, allegedly. But that's not like stealing money. So to me, he is not, he's not a thief, okay? Uh, for he He did maybe allow some things that the American government doesn't like. But it's very, very different to me from SBF, who was like literally just stealing other people's money. And it's much worse. Uh, my, my personal problem with both of these cases, uh, big and uh, you know uh, vocal as they might be, is that they have very little to do with crypto specifically. It's just basically bad behavior of a large financial institution uh, one is a Ponzi scheme and stealing customer funds. The other one is money laundering or whatever the allegations are. But uh, crypto is a kind of a uh, collateral uh, damage, a bystander, which uh, now the regulators take as this kind of, uh, uh, you know, excuse to, 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 to pile on without like any relation. But yeah, other than that, I, I'm totally with you. And my hope is, by the way, that in, in three to five years, uh, DEXs will overcome the centralized exchanges uh, because the, the user experience will be will, will be much better and uh, you don't need to pay a lot of money to all those guys when you have smart contracts doing this for you. And uh, Uniswap now has more volume than Coinbase, just for everyone to know. Uniswap, which is just running somewhere on the blockchain, just a bunch of smart contracts, is doing more volume in trading than Coinbase that has about 3,000 employees and blah, 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 and listing on NASDAQ and all that. Uh, so this yeah, shows so, us the power. So I, I totally agree. but uh, And this is kind of a maybe even a topic for a separate time, but because it's, it's really long and there is a lot to talk about. But I feel that um, in many uh, examples that we see, and even when we say that DEXs like Uniswap, they're decentralized, but uh, I think that the value of decentralization recently has uh, been weakened a lot. And uh, I will just give you an example. So uh, obviously, the, most of the front ends are centralized. And obviously, uh, when we're talking about USDT and USDC, there are functions that allow you to block funds and freeze funds that we see used every day. True, almost. yeah. But even even worse than that, let's say Bitcoin, which is like you know uh, the, the the most kind of important and basic value is decentralization. Uh, all these stories with the mining pools that are censoring transactions uh, either because they have uh, inscriptions or uh, offer lists or whatever. It 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 moves in the wrong direction. So I feel at least right now it it goes kind of to less decentralized and um, in like Lido, whatever. Like there are a lot of examples where centralization eventually takes over. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think I think we can uh, agree that it's, uh, I mean, we need to, to see how we can fight this. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think like to, to, a, a, a good thing is that uh, whatever happens, crypto will be less centralized than the banking system and less uh, prone to censorship and all that uh, because it is just global and it's very hard to to do that on a global scale uh, not like with banking Uh, but yeah definitely uh, I guess maybe we can see that this is part of the crypto industry growing up and becoming like a real important uh, systemic player 
in the world economy. Uh, maybe it's not not there yet, but you know, right now crypto is, I think, already kind of too big to fail. Uh, so the, even the governments, they, I don't think. I mean, I think it would be crazy to try to destroy it in total. So they they want to start kind of controlling. It's hard, but but yeah, I agree. So there's you know, Uniswap is using uh, TRM Labs or chain analysis. You know, when you when you trade, they check your wallet on their centralized front end. They do have a decentralized one on IPFS. You can use that as well. But whatever is centralized, they have to comply to some to some stuff. And anyone who is in the states or serving the states, the United States people, it, it has to do that. And this will probably come to more places. But again, I think it's still way better than than the banking system. Way faster uh, and uh, way cheaper in the end. But yeah, yeah, Alex, I, 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 yeah, I think uh, you know this cypherpunk dream uh, is maybe now further away than than it was like five years ago. Okay, so, <laughs> so first of all, thank you very much. Uh, it's been it's been great talk. Uh, we have about ten minutes left, and I would like to uh, uh, kind of uh, talk uh, uh, about our developments because uh, we have uh, Vladi here, and uh, as you know, Vladi is working. Uh, until he starts working on secrets, he's working on the e Ethereum virtual machine implementation on Beam, uh, which is kind of a big deal. So, Alexander Sadison, thank you very much for joining us, and uh, uh, it, it's been amazing. Uh, come as often as you can, obviously, you're always welcome. And uh, uh, with that, I would like to ask Vladi to say a few words about the work he's been doing for the last many months on EVM integration to Beam and how it's going and what what he's doing, Vladi, if, yeah, here he is. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Can you hear anyone? I think you're good to go now, Vlad. Yeah. 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 Working on the event implementation on top of the BIM blockchain. Uh, so no, the main reason we are doing this is basically to to support the uh, contacts which uh, were already developed uh, for Ethereum to run uh, them uh, transparently on BIM blockchain. So uh, I, I can uh, I can describe it this way uh, on on my side I mean on, on the side of of, of uh, on, on the north side it's not uh, it's not a tremendous work to do but basically uh, I think I'm nearly finishing but uh, that will not be the end because of, uh, some work will, uh, will have to be done on the wallet side because the user will have to integrate with MetaMask or something similar to create the account uh, uh, with, with this ecosystem uh, on, on top of BIM blockchain and uh, be, uh, be able to deploy contacts and interact with, with contacts. Uh, some work is still remain in, in this uh, area. So just uh, for uh, kind of the audience that is maybe less familiar or uh, new or uh, uh, you know just don't know how it works and why uh, when Vladi says that it wasn't a tremendous amount of work, maybe for him it wasn't, but it was a crazy amount of work. So so basically uh, the current Beam virtual machine it works. Uh, on top of uh, Mimble Wimble and on top of extension kernels, which allow us to uh, create instructions basically in our transactions that are then interpreted by the node and then run through the contract, which is running inside the virtual machine that Vladi wrote from scratch. And the idea of allowing Ethereum virtual machine to run alongside, basically not replacing, but supporting both virtual machines at the same time is that Vladi had to implement the entire Ethereum virtual machine from scratch and then make it work with our current node infrastructure using the same similar uh, structures, concepts, and mechanisms that we already have. So it was crazy amount of work. But uh, yes, indeed, one of the issues is that we are now also need to add support to the wallet to create those transactions. And because Ethereum virtual machine is used to you know working on Ethereum, so it has addresses, uh, which are encoded differently and encrypted differently. So all of this is uh, uh, still something that we need to do. But uh, I think, Vladi, you, you did a lot already. Okay. 
<laughs> so, but, yeah. uh, I just want to emphasize, the whole idea is to allow for existing contracts and, and the uh, appropriate uh, frontends to be deployed smoothly on our blockchain. Because otherwise, uh, I don't know, may I say it, uh, I, I personally, I believe that, uh, you know, using EVM is a big step backward compared to our virtual machine. Because, you know, in, 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 many, in, in many ways, be it, you know, in, in terms of, of privacy and performance and the MEV, things like this, which we basically solved with our, uh, with our design of virtual machine. Yeah, that's, that's the problem, that it's a technology which is very popular, but it definitely is not the best technology, but it's uh, hard to argue that uh, most smart contract developers work in Solidity. And uh, we, we do want to allow existing contracts to be able to run smoothly on Beam. And there are quite a lot of contracts out there that are doing a great job. Uh, Uniswap is just one example. And by the way, Uniswap is something that you use for testing, right? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So Uniswap is already kind of mostly at least running. And by the way, Uniswap also is uh, is improving. They're adding more features and uh, more functionality, not to mention new projects that are kind of mm -hmm. appearing like crazy every day. So uh, like uh, one of the reasons that we, uh, after a long, long period of deliberations, we decided to add EVM is because of the ecosystem. Otherwise, technologically, it, it makes no sense. We already have a great virtual machine. And eventually, what, what, what happened is that Vladi actually also implemented most of the smart contracts that are running on Beam today. And it also covers the entire spectrum of functionality, starting from DEX that we have, and NFT gallery, and, uh, you know, all the other DeFi applications that we have. So, so yeah. Gus, do you have any questions for Vladi? If, if you if you are there, if not, yes, no. I I have a question. What's the what do you consider the biggest like uh, trade off for people launching uh, applications on Beam when they like when the EVMs? available, what would be the biggest trade-off using the EVM versus the Beam virtual machine in your eyes? Uh, well, in my, in my opinion, uh, in my opinion, the, the biggest value of, of EVM basically is, is just the ability to just to grab an existing contract and deploy it smoothly on Beam and use it as is. In my, in my view, is that the only... Uh, that's the only benefit because otherwise our virtual machine, uh, I believe it, 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 uh, it's, it's superior from the performance point of view. It just, it also, it also has, has many mean, means to protect against uh, MEV and it's uh, private by design, you know, I mean, I mean the, the contact logic is not private, but, uh, but you know, you, 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 you receive all, all, all our features. For example, you can build a transaction which simultaneously uh, involves a contract and you know I, I don't know for example it can uh, take funds from the contract and split between several users so that they build this uh, transaction uh, like a multi-party -part computation and simultaneously you can put it in another contract and do whatever logic and you should the output and you can do it, this always one it just it's like a construction game you can do crazy things with this because you know, Ethereum, you know it's uh, it's it's very straightforward in this way it just you know uh, I, I, I do some action from this address, I trigger contact uh, by that address, and then I do, and I do something. And it's all visible. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, so one of the things that Ethereum did, uh, in my opinion, really well, well, like to give them credit, I mean, there is a lot of credit to give, but this specifically something that uh, uh, I think was crucial is developing this standard system um, the Ethereum improvement proposals like ERC-20 or any other token standard, uh, which allows all of the participants in the ecosystem to uh, be able to handle uh, whether it's a fungible token or an NFT or a collection of NFTs. And um, uh, obviously they had a lot more um, you know, activity and a lot of more projects participating. So obviously it was very valuable to do that, but this is something that we didn't do, uh, mostly because of lack of uh, resources and time. 
And uh, so even though we do support uh, a very interesting and flexible architecture that you can create an application that uses several contracts uh, and it's all kind of wrapped up in a single application which runs locally, which is also very important. Um, by the way, this is something that I think that Ethereum is not uh, giving enough attention to, ability to run applications locally, because all of the Ethereum applications today, they either use centralized frontends, which is very bad, uh, but they also all rely on Infura or Alchemy or other providers of data because nobody uh, can run a node on their local machine. And in Beam, a node runs in your wallet and any desktop wallet can run its own node and uh, not rely on anyone, which in my opinion is a great benefit. But uh, the question is how to integrate and how to use these benefits in practical use cases that people use. And I think that EVM will help us uh, with that. Or at least that's the idea. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Vladi. Uh, we are uh, approaching the hour. And uh, first of all, thank you very much, everyone, uh, being here with us. And thanks, Alexander Zeisen, for joining. It's been great. I'm yeah, really sure. sure. Thank you, guys. A pleasure. I'd, I'd love to join more. By the way, one thing I wanted to comment there was like, a question and obviously you understand the answer right now uh, on Twitter like will Vladi be able to continue to contribute to Beam and the question is of course yes uh, and uh, you know I don't think it could be otherwise um, and uh, yeah so it's not like uh, uh, like you, you Beam will not see anymore uh, if he wants of course right I mean yeah, from from our secret side I mean there's no no problem at all with that just to reassure the community because there was a question like that on Twitter. So I wanted to address that. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, everybody was actually really worried. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, in my opinion, uh, the very fact that eventually we are continuing to contribute to privacy and privacy related projects is in and of itself a great achievement. Uh, you being CEO of two now, uh, and, uh, you know, obviously Vladi brings a lot of experience from building privacy for the last five years, which is crazy in this space and uh, the top level. And Beam technology is amazing. And Vladi was one of the key people who, who developed all that. Uh, the node, the smart contract, the virtual machine, it's all him. So, yeah, you, you, get, you get a great, great guy and great talent here. So, yeah, good luck. Very to cool. Of you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, and thank you very Great. much. And thank you, guys. See you next week. Heartwarming. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.